Chapter forty one of Tante. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Tante by Anne Douglas Sedgwick. Chapter forty one. It seemed to Karen, after hours had passed, that she had ceased to be tired, and that her body, wafted by an involuntary rhythm, was as light as thistle-down on the wind. She had crossed the goonhilly downs, where the moonlight, spreading far and wide, with vast unearthly brightness, filled all the vision with immensities of space, and brought memories of strains from Schubert symphonies, silver monotonies of never-ending sound. She had plunged down winding roads, blackly shadowed by their hedgerow trees, passing sometimes a cottage that slept between its clumps of fuchsia and veronica she had climbed bare hillsides where abandoned mines or quarries had left desolate mementos that looked in the moonlight like ancient tombs and catacombs horror lay behind her at less solitudes a long low cloud on the horizon to which she had turned her back the misery that had overpowered and made her one with its dread realities lay beneath her feet she was lifted above it in a strange disembodied enfranchisement all the night and the steady blowing of the wind the leagues of silver the mighty sky with its far high priestess were part of an ecstasy of sadness impersonal serene hallucinated like that of the music that accompanied the rhythm of her feet the night was almost over and dawn was coming when on a long uphill road she felt her heart flag and her footsteps stagger the moon still rode sharp and high but its light seemed concentrated in its own glittering disk and the world was visible in an uncanny darkness that was not dark the magic of the night had vanished and the beat of vast winding melodies melted from karen's mind leaving her dry and brittle and empty like a shell from which the tides have drawn away she knew what she had still to do at the top of the road she was to turn and cut across fields to a headland above falmouth from which a path she knew led to the town she had not gone to helston but had taken this cross-country way to falmouth because she knew that at any hour of the night she might be missed and followed and captured they would not think of falmouth they would not dream that she could walk so far in the town she would pawn uncle ernst's watch and take the early train to london and by evening she would be with frau lippheim so she had seen it all in flashes last night but now toiling up the interminable road clots of darkness floating before her eyes cold sweat standing on her forehead the sense of her exhaustion crushed down upon her she tried to fix her thoughts on the trivial memories and forecasts that danced in her mind the odd blinking of mrs talcott's eyelid as she had told her story the pattern of the breakfast set that she and gregory had used ah no not that she must not fix that memory the roofs and chimneys of some little german town where she was to find a refuge for though it was to join the lipheims that she fled she did not see her life as led with theirs leaning upon these pictures as if upon a staff she held she reached the hilltop her head now seemed to dance like a balloon buffeted by the great throbs of her blood she trailed with leaden feet across the fields in the last high meadow she paused and looked down at the bend of the great bay under the pallid sky and at the town lying like a scattering of shells along its edge how distant it was how like a mirage a little tree was beside her and its leaves in the uncanny light looked like crisp black metal the sea was gray the sunrise was still far off karen sank beneath the tree and leaned her head against it what should she do if she were unable to walk on there was still time hours and hours of time till the train left falmouth but how was she to reach falmouth fears rolled in upon her like dark breakers heaping themselves one upon the other 
stealthy swift not to be escaped she saw the horrible kindness in mrs talcott's eyes relegated not relinquished she saw herself pursued entrapped confronted by gregory equally entrapped forced by her need her helplessness to come to her and coldly determined as she had seen him on that dreadful evening of their parting to do his duty by her to make her and to keep her safe and his own dignity secure to see him again to strive against him again weaponless now without refuge and reveal to herself and to him as a creature whose whole life had been founded on illusion to strive not only against his ironic authority but worst of all against a longing unavowed unlooked at a longing that crippled and unstrung her and that ran under everything like a hidden river under granite hills she would die she felt rather than endure it she had closed her eyes as she leaned her head against the tree and when she opened them she saw that the leaves of the tree had turned from black to green and that the grass was green and the sea and sky faintly blue above her head the long carved ripples of the morning cirri flushed with a heavenly pink and there came from a thicket of a little wood the first soft whistle of a wakened bird another came and then another and suddenly the air was full of an almost jangling sweetness karen felt herself trembling shudders ran over her she was ravished to life yet without the answering power of life her longing her loneliness her fear were part of the intolerable loveliness and they pierced her through and through she struggled to her feet holding the tree in her clasp and after the galvanized effort she closed her eyes again and again leaned her head upon the bark then it was that she heard footsteps sudden footsteps near for a moment a paralysis of fear held down her eyelids ach gott she heard and before her eyes she saw franz lippheim before her franz lippheim was dressed very strangely dressed in tweeds and knickerbockers and wore a soft round hat with a quill in it the oddest of hats and had a knapsack on his back the colors of the coming day were caricatured in his ruddy face and red gold hair his bright green stockings and bright red tie he was germanic flagrant incredible and a perseus an undreamed of god-sent perseus ah god can it be so he was saying as he approached her walking softly as though in fear of dispersing a vision and as not speaking still clasping her tree she held out her hand to him he saw the extremity of her exhaustion and put his arm around her she did not faint she kept her consciousness of the blue sky and the cirri golden now and even of franz's tie and eyeglasses glistening golden in the rising sunlight but he had lowered her gently to the ground kneeling beside her and was supporting her shoulders and putting brandy to her lips after a little while he made her drink some milk and then she could speak to him she must speak and she must tell him that she had left her guardian she must speak of tante but what to say of her the shame and pity that had gone with her for days laid their fingers on her lips as she thought of tante and why she had left her her mind groped for some availing substitute franz she said you must help me i have left tante you will not question me there is a breach between us she has been unkind to me i can never see her again and now with clearer thought she found a sufficient truth she has not understood about me and my husband she has tried to make me go back to him and i have fled from her because i was afraid that she would send for him she is not as fond of me as i thought she was franz and i was a burden to her when i came franz will you take me to london to your mother i am going with you all to germany i am going to earn my living there du lieber gott herr lippheim ejaculated he stared at karen in consternation our great lady our great tante has been unkind to you is it then possible karen yes franz you must believe me you must not question me 
trust me my karen said herr lippheim now do not fear it shall be as you say but i cannot take you to the mutterchen in london for she is not there they have gone back to germany karen and it is to germany that we must go can you take me there franz at once i have no money but i am going to pawn this watch that uncle ernst gave me that is all simple my karen i have money i took with me the money for my tour i was on a walking tour do you see and reached falmouth last night and had but started now to pay my respects at les solitudes i wished to see you karen and to see if you were well but it is very far to your village how have you come so far at night i walked i have walked all night i am so tired franz so tired i do not know how i shall go any further she closed her eyes her head rested against his shoulder franz lippheim looked down at her with an infinite compassion and gentleness it will all be well my karen do not fear he said the train does not go from falmouth for three hours still we will take it then and go to southampton and sail for germany to-night and for now you will drink this milk so yes that is well and eat this chocolate you cannot it will be for later then and you will lie still with my cloak around you so and you will sleep and i will sit beside you and you will have no troubled thoughts you are with your friends my karen while he spoke he had wrapped her round and laid her head softly on a folded garment that he drew from his knapsack and in a few moments he saw that she slept the profound sleep of complete exhaustion franz lippheim sat above her not daring to light his pipe for fear of waking her he watched the glory of the sunrise it was perhaps the most wonderful hour in franz's life phrases of splendid music passed through his mind mingling with the sound of the sea no personal pain and no personal hope was in his heart he was uplifted translated with the beauty of the hour and its significance karen needed him karen was to come to them he was to see her henceforward in his life he was to guard and help her he was her friend the splendor and the peace of the golden sky and golden sea were the angels of a great initiation nothing could henceforth be as it had been his brain stirred with exquisite intuitions finding form for them in the loved music that henceforth he would play as he had never before played it and when he looked from the sea and sky down at the sleeping face beside him wasted and drawn and piteous in its repose large tears rose in his eyes and flowed down his cheeks and the sadness was more beautiful than any joy that he had known what she had suffered the dear one what they must help her to forget to her also the hour would send its angels she would wake to a new life he turned his eyes again to the rising sun and his heart silently chanted its love and pride and sadness in the phrases of beethoven of schubert and of brahms and from time to time softly he muttered to himself this stout young german jew with the red necktie and the strange round hat sus is kind unglückliches kind oh der schon tag end of chapter forty one